Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and I'm so glad you've joined me this evening for part four of our story which is the final part of our story so it's very very exciting and I'm looking forward to it and we're about to hear Hamish's story about what really did happen that day when they returned home to the farmhouse with their hair braided. So let's continue with our story. Hamish's story in his own words. When the Dumbarton family moved to the countryside, none of us resisted the move. We were all on exactly the same page, as everybody in our family loved nature, and getting away from the bustle of city life suited us all just fine. Luckily my father was able to do the land share of his work from home, behind a computer, and occasionally commute to Denver a couple of times a month. Both me and my brother were enrolled in a very good school, so everything worked out fine for us. Before long, our family had horses, ATVs and a couple of little Yorkshire Terriers that soon decided to hang around fee all day and had absolutely no time for the rest of us, as they literally seemed to be joined to fee by an invisible umbilical cord. Fee had grown up with Yorkshire Terriers, so she loved them very much. My father would have preferred big dogs, but that was not going to happen. As shortly after we moved in, Fee rocked up to the house one day with two tiny Yorkshire Terriers, and that was that. But we all grew very attached to them, as you do. My stepmother Fee was the best thing that happened to our family. My mother had died of a brain aneurysm when I was five years old, so I barely have much memory of her, which is an awful pity. Since then we were raised by my father, who brought us to England for a couple of years, when he had to launch his American company to the UK market. It was in my father's spare time that he would go out riding with several riders on the weekend. They all would go together on treks on horseback, and that was where my father met Fee and fell hard for her. And, of course, the rest is history. Fee came back with us to America after divorcing her husband. Then she married my father. She was very regretful that she had left behind her a trail of devastation in her wake, but I understood why she did what she did. At the end of the day, we have to live our true authentic lives, even if it might initially appear rather selfish. Sometimes to do so, we cannot help but hurt others in the process, but we have to honour our truth and try to make amends for our mistakes. That's all we can do. I think Fee's biggest mistake was marrying far too young. But I was glad she had a daughter because it meant Lucy would become our stepsister and gaining a sister was really cool, although at that stage we had never met her. We moved into a red-bricked, very English-looking Georgian farmhouse in the countryside, overlooking fields, groves of trees and billowing silhouettes of the mountains that smudged the sky with their voluptuous, shapely contours, sometimes dramatically shrouded by wisps of moving mist. Within no time at all, me and my brother adapted very easily to country life. We were out and about all the time, riding horses, ATVs and of course mountain bikes. Every day my stepmother Fee was up and about at the crack of dawn, working with the horses and taking care of their intrinsic needs. Fee began to offer people horse riding lessons, as she was a natural horsewoman who had been riding horses since she was seven years old. She was an excellent rider and a great teacher. One day during the summer holidays, me and my brother were riding our ATVs in the Woodgrove on our property, and we were having a wonderful time together as you do. The Woodgrove is always incredibly beautiful, boasting four dramatic seasonal changes from spring to summer, and of course autumn and winter. One thing that never ever changes around here, and forever remains consistent, is of course the inevitability of enjoying crisp sweet mountain air and, of course, the pleasing aromatic turpins of the woody scents from the trees in the grove. "'So what are you going to do today?' my stepmother asked us. "'It must have been about the fifth day of our summer holidays, I suspect. "'If you're looking for something to do, you can always help me muck out the stables if you like.' "'No, thanks,' I said, buttering my toast determinedly. "'I didn't mind helping Fee with the horses.' But so early in the holidays, I wanted to relax and enjoy myself. I had no intention of mucking out stables today. I was determined we were going to have an adventure. Me and Cameron are going to the Woodgrove on our ATVs, I explained. Sorry, we can't help you, 
another time, perhaps. I'll hold you to that, Hamish, said Fee, giving me a wink, as she knocked back her glass of fresh orange juice. I think it's a beautiful day to ride your ATVs. Make sure you're back in time for lunch. Hear that, boys, my father interjected. Fee wants you back in time for lunch. Now don't go letting her down. Of course we won't let her down, we assured my father. So there me and my brother were, riding our ATVs through the grove of trees, listening to the pretty trills of the birds and the branches above our heads, and enjoying the feeling of riding up the undulating paths of the grove, which was rather hilly at the best of times, but not too challenging for our ATVs. They could really perform some cool, rather nifty stunts on their robust, nimble wheels. Before long we came to our favourite spot in the woodgrove. There are no words to describe this blissfully idyllic, tranquil wooded sanctuary, where a brisk stream of water collides through the woods, sounding like hundreds of galloping stallions, thundering past you at one hell of a speed. The water is so clear, so translucid, that you can actually see your own feet when standing in it. The stream is surrounded by trees on every side. Some, of course, are weeping willows, with long feathery leaves that graciously skim the water in a downward dog-like motion, almost as if the trees themselves are engaging in yoga. I know me and my brother did what we always do. We began paddling in the stream with our long pants rolled up above our knees, enjoying the feeling of the blasts of icy cold water moving past us, massaging our toes. After we'd frolicked around in the water for quite some time, like two toddlers in a play pool, we got out of the water and just sat there, enjoying the peaceful, quiet ambience of the grove, and doing absolutely nothing at all but listening to the sounds of the forest as you do, from the birds to the obstreperous motion of the water. It was almost like the coming one with absolutely everything around you, so it was as if we were caught up in a meditation. All of a sudden we heard what I can only describe as heavy feet, thundering across the ground, that was louder than the water itself. I looked at my brother perturbed and said, What's that? He raised a brow. I've no idea, he said. We both knew something was coming, and whatever it was, it had to be substantial in size. It's ironic because we weren't even the teensiest, weensiest bit afraid. You'd think we would ultimately panic and hurriedly run back onto our ATVs and get back to the farmhouse as quickly as we could. And even though we found the sound of the feet intimidating, we knew at once that this could not be a person, unless, of course, he weighed close to a thousand pounds. And even though there's some hefty people in America, let's not kid, they would unlikely to be walking around in a grove if they weighed that much. I kid you not when I say the ground vibrated and heaved, and you heard the snap and crackle and pop sound that you hear when eating pop dry cereal, only this was much louder and came from the twigs being broken beneath ponderous feet. For a moment it was almost as if time stood still, for the both of us, that is, as if something was holding back the very hands of time. It was almost like we were at the theatre, and were waiting in anticipation for the thick velvety curtains to be drawn back on the stage, and for the play to unfold before our very eyes. We had become like spectators, and we both instinctively sensed Something profound was about to happen, although we had absolutely no idea what to expect. It was rather like putting your money in the slot of a music machine and waiting to see what song it would ultimately play. That was when we saw him there standing not too far away from us. I will say this, he did not see us. I think he was focused on getting to the water for some reason. Me and my brother were so quiet that unless you had been looking directly at us, you'd have never known we were there. We were sitting there close to the edge of the stream on a hilly obtrusion that jutted through the ground like a daybed or a king's throne, if you like, made from rocks, sheltered by the overhanging branches of weeping willows that probably made us even less conspicuous. I knew at once I was seeing a Bigfoot. There was no doubt about this in my mind. I was passionate about the programme Finding Bigfoot and my brother had teased me tirelessly about my fixation on the subject telling me that there was no way that these powerful creatures could exist here in North America. Obstensively, unless I was caught up in some kind of delusional, bizarre, outer-worldly dream, 
it would seem that my brother now had egg on his face and would have to retract his protestations, as this Bigfoot that he claimed did not exist was standing in our line of vision, clear to see. I was so astounded by what I was perceiving that my mouth dropped wide open and my eyes grew so wide I'm surprised they didn't drop out of their sockets. I could hear my brother sitting beside me. He seemed to be breathing quite fast. I'm quite sure he probably felt like he'd been thrown off his perch and was completely gobsmacked. If it was hard for me to get my head around what I was seeing, it must have been a thousand times more challenging for my brother, as he was likely wondering if he was hallucinating. Even I was rubbing my eyes in bewilderment and thinking, no way, I can't possibly be seeing this. This has to be a dream. The Bigfoot at this point had no clue that he was being watched. I took him all in, ensuring that every part of him was burnt into my memory, because I did not want to forget him. I was in no doubt that I would probably never see him again. I think it would be a good guess to say he was about eight foot tall, possibly taller. I never physically saw his male anatomy, as it was well covered in hair, but I knew he was male. Not because he had no breasts, of course, but his energy was so palpably masculine. Even the way he walked towards the water, swinging his arms, was done in a macho kind of King of the Woods type of way, which is hard to actually explain. It was like he owned the grove, and nothing remotely intimidated him. The Bigfoot was gargantuan in size, and I think nothing prepares you for his Herculean proportions. He stood up on two powerful tree-trunk-sized legs that were nimble, and even though he moved towards the water noisily, his movements were fluid and graceful. I noticed he was covered with what I can only describe as a tortoiseshell-coloured hair, and in the light shards that streamed through the boughs of the trees, the red in his hair colour stood out, which was really rather beautiful. I was stunned to see the creature had braided some of the hairs on his chest into tiny, tiny little braids, which meant I could clearly see the powerful definition of his muscular torso beneath his skin. It was so impressive, I would have killed for a torso like that. I remember thinking to myself, sorry Arnie, in terms of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was in his prime, of course, but you've been outdone, bro. At this point in time, I had not seen the Bigfoot's face, as it was focused on the water, but I watched him leaning over the water's edge and cupping the water in the palm of his hands proficiently and drinking thirstily. All of a sudden, I guess he must have known he was being watched. He quickly looked up at us, and I remember our eyes met his. I'll never forget the moment the Bigfoot's treacle-coloured eyes met mine. I have never, ever looked into eyes like this before. There was something incredible about those eyes. I felt as if I was looking into a fountain of knowledge, as if this creature knew things I had no way of ever knowing, as if he had outer-worldly powers beyond my grasp, as if I was looking into a swirling pool of intelligence. If that was not incongruously strange and rather outlandish, the next thing that happened is I heard a voice in my head that was not my own. I knew at once it belonged to the Bigfoot. He was speaking to me telepathically. He said, I didn't expect to see the both of you there. You took me by surprise. This is not good, he said, shaking his head. I remember thinking to myself, he's rather upset that we've seen him, and my thoughts were answered like a question. Of course I'm upset you've seen me. Your kind can never see us, unless it's in your greatest good. But this was not in the plan, your seeing me. He shook his head fretfully, and that was when I noticed he had a very short neck. This time I asked the Bigfoot a question in my head, and against all the odds he continued communicating with us in some form of telepathic exchange, which was nothing short of incredulous. But why does it matter that we saw you? We won't tell anyone we saw you if that helps. I get why you like to remain elusive for the preservation of your species. Me and my brother are happy to keep Storm and pretend we never saw you at all, if that's going to help. I'm not upset with you, young man, the Bigfoot told me. I'm upset with myself, if you must know. I was too caught up in my own world and my thoughts to actually notice you. And that never happens. I'm normally incredibly shrewd that I don't miss a thing. But today my head's all over the place. And it's Nempina's fault. 
Nampina's fault, I asked. Who's Nampina? And that was when I noticed a sadness in the Bigfoot's eyes. He dropped his head sorrowfully to one side and said, I've loved Nampina since I was little. She was the one for me, you know, he said, patting his heart tenderly. My heart is aching. It's very sore, but it will be better soon. I need to start paying attention to my surroundings. Stop being so self-absorbed. Your seeing me is not at all good. I'm sorry, but what did happen with Nampina? You want to know what happened with me and Nampina? Well, me and my brother, we shared a womb together, which I took to mean he was a twin. Yesterday we let Nampina draw the stone. My father receives a stone from me and a stone from my brother. He shuffles the stones in his fists, and then he allows Nampina to choose which fist she wants. When my father opened the fist that Nampina had chosen, she selected my brother's stone. So Nampina now belongs to him, not to me. So you can see why I'm very melancholic. But that's not fair. It shouldn't be done like that, I said. But of course it's fair, young man. Nimpina made her choice, didn't she? She chose my brother's energy over mine. It was meant to be. You must never interfere with the perfect divine order and synchronicity of the universe. If you do mess around with such things, they will become fragmented and fall apart. Of course I'm sorrowful, and I'm still very much alone. I thought Nimpina was meant to be the one for me, but I was wrong. I know my father will find me another partner very soon. And I would like a partner, for I don't want to be on my own. I hope she'll be as lovely in her heart energy as Nampina is. For beauty of the soul is the rhythm of the heart, and it's everything to me. I rarely had a heart for Nampina, but it was not in my life plan. It wasn't orchestrated for me before I was born, which I thought it was. So I respect that. But now the problem is the both of you. What am I going to do about you? You were not meant to see me, and if my kind knew how foolhardy I had been, they would not be best pleased with me. I'm sorry, but as I told you, we can pretend we never saw you. Will that work out for you? I need to make you forget that you saw me. Please don't do that. I don't want to forget you. I'm really glad I met you, and I think we were meant to meet you. I don't want to forget this day. It's one of the weirdest but best things that has ever happened to me in my life meeting you. Please don't make the memory go away for us. I'm begging you. I tell you what I will do. Since I like you both very much, and your energies please my heart. I see you both as friends. And as you say, I'm not sad to have crossed paths with you. Even though it was never supposed to be on the script of your lives to meet me. I will leave behind an imprint in your memory, so that you will be in no doubt that you met me, but will also seem so surreal that another part of yourself, the critical side of your brain, will be saying, but did that really happen? So your memory of this experience from time to time will be clouded with doubt. Well, I can live with that. I can definitely live with that, as long as you don't wipe this memory away because I really want to remember you, even if I doubt that I actually saw you. In that moment, I heard my brother telepathically agreeing with this plan. I just want one favour, he asked the Bigfoot. Name it, said the Bigfoot, and I will see if I can oblige your request. I'm really sorry about Nampina. What happened really sucks. But when your dad finds you a new partner, can you leave us a sign in the Woodgrove that it's happened for you? It'll make me happy to think you've found someone new to love. What kind of a sign would you like me to leave you? Asked the Bigfoot, scratching his head reflectively, as if caught up in deep contemplation. I'm not sure. I thought you could think of something. I tell you what I will do. You see this tree over here? He said, pointing to the willow tree, not far from his feet. When I have found a new love for myself... You will discover that there will be two rocks under the tree. Two rocks that neither of you could pick up. I will place them here. 
The big one represents me. The smaller one represents my partner. And when we have younglings over the years, I will put stones under the tree, so you shall know. A blue stone will be for a boy, a pink stone for a girl. Will that suit your interests well? Will that satisfy you? It seemed like a good deal for us, so we agreed with the Bigfoot. I do remember he told us it had been a pleasure to meet us. We did exchange further communication of what I cannot remember, as beyond that we have no memory at all, apart from having woken up beside the stream so many hours later, feeling woozy and light-headed, as if we'd come out of a dreamlike sleep, or an anaesthetic, you could say. What the hell happened? I asked my brother, when I woke up from my sleep, rubbing my eyes and staring around at my environment in confoundment. Had I really fallen asleep by the stream? I was so surprised, as I'd never fallen asleep in nature before, apart from when I'd been camping and had been lying in a sleeping bag under a canvas canopy. As I woke up, I remember the Bigfoot me and my brother had seen, and wondered if I had dreamt it, but it had felt so profoundly real. I think we both fell asleep by the stream, said my brother, looking rather bewildered. I noticed that he was wiping the sleep from his eyes and letting out a stifled yawn. He glanced down briefly at his watch and his eyes widened in horror. We should have been home a long time ago. We've been by the stream for about five hours. How did that happen? We've long since missed lunch. We promised Fee we'd be back for lunch. My guess is Dad is going to be absolutely hopping mad with us. But Fee, no Fee will be understanding. What's wrong? asked Cameron as I stared at him in a strange way, before we headed off back to the farmhouse. Your hair! I pointed out. You've got hundreds of tiny braids in your hair. Where did those come from? My brother began to feel his hair, and looked at me agog, when his fingers felt the texture of the braids. You too! Your hair is covered in braids! Oh Lord! said my brother. I had a dream about a Bigfoot, but it must be true. In the dream he told us he'd leave us a sign that we met him. And this is the sign, don't you see? Our hair has been braided. And they're the very same braids we saw on the Bigfoot's torso. We definitely saw him. So it was real, I said excitedly. I had the same dream. I think we met a Bigfoot. I can hardly believe it. We did indeed, bro. And I for one do not doubt it was not a dream. We need to get back to the house before Dad throws a wobbly at us. He's going to think we've got no manners at all, not returning home for lunch. You know what he's like. Thank God Fee will probably calm him down. Me and my brother, sensing we needed to return to the farmhouse pronto, hurriedly began to look for our ATVs. But we couldn't find them anywhere and were freaking out. So we decided we'd better make tracks to the farmhouse without our ATVs, which would mean we'd arrive back home later than ever to be met by a less than amused reception. We wisely did not want to add fuel to the fire. If we told him our ATVs had gone missing, we knew he would not react well to it, so we decided we would return home and search for our ATVs the following morning, in the hope that we might find them. We knew where we'd parked them, and the fact that they had disappeared was rather baffling for us. When we got home, I brazenly rather foolishly told my father, that we'd fallen asleep by the stream and woken up with braided hair. Thank God I didn't expand upon our story. My father was not buying any of it. To say he was furious with us for missing lunch that Fee had prepared for us was an understatement. My father had very fixed views about how youngsters should be raised. He believed me and my brother came from a very spoilt, self-centred, lazy, mollycoddled generation that fails to be appreciative and lacks manners so he has tried his level best to install them in us. Let me tell you, when we rocked up looking dishevelled and dirty, with grass in our hair, my father was not very happy. With hands on hips, he glared at us defiantly, glancing down at his watch. How very nice of you, Cameron and Hamish, to grace us with your appearance, your highnesses. I hope you enjoyed your time in the Woodgrove, while your lady's maid, Fee here, was preparing your lunch for you. I hope you're proud of yourselves for being incredibly rude. I'm so sorry, Dad. We both are, I said gingerly, looking at my father with pleading eyes like a scolded dog. You're sorry, Hamish. Is that all you can say? 
said my father, growing as red as a field of poppies. Fee was preparing lunch for you. You were supposed to be back at three hours ago. Five hours, actually. But did you rock up for lunch? No, you didn't. What do I keep telling you about your generation? All you youngsters ever think about is me, myself and I. It's the story of your lives, is it not? Do you stop to think about how hard Fee has been slaving away over the stove to make you a nice lunch? And you didn't have the decency to even bother to show up. You kids make me sick. I'm so sorry, Dad. Me and Cameron, we didn't mean to be rude, but it's not what you think. We were sitting by the stream. We fell fast asleep for many hours. And when we woke up, our hair had been mysteriously braided. You can see our hair is both braided. Lots and lots of tiny braids. Cameron was making a warning face at me over my last foolish comments. He sagaciously preempted my father's less than amused reaction to my outlandish claims. Is that the best you can do, son? My father looked as if he was about to clobber me over the ear. He was so mad at me. If you want to tell me lies, you're going to have to do a lot better than that, Hamish, for me to actually believe you. Fee was trying to calm my father down. Don't be hard on them, love. Kids will be kids. Give them a break. You were young once. I'm sure you got up to all kinds of mischief when you were their age. I was young once, I agree. But I'll tell you something for nothing. My father said, waving his finger. Never once did I disobey my father. If I was expected back home for lunch, I would always be home on time. And I never came up with ridiculous excuses. We only have your word for that, said Fee, giving us both a wink. For we all know you might have broken the rules more times than you care to remember. But you'll never admit that to us, would you, dear? It's not funny, Fee. I'm trying to teach both of my children to respect the boundaries we lay down for them. And for the record, I was a lot better behaved than Cameron and Hamish were, growing up. That's for sure. Even so, love, it's the school holidays, isn't it? Kids are allowed to let their hair down once in a while. Besides, the lunch I was cooking was all terribly informal. Nothing special. I certainly wasn't slaving away over the stove, as you suggest. Thankfully, Fee diffused the situation. She's good for Dad in that way. She manages to calm him down. But we never told him our ATVs were missing. And the next day, at the earliest opportunity, we found them, exactly where we'd parked them the day before. It was so extraordinary, to say the least. For when we had looked for our ATVs, they were gone. But now here they were. And on each ATV, we discovered a slender, dark braid. And we knew the braids came from the Bigfoot. He must have cut them off his torso to give to us, telling us in no uncertain terms that our encounter with him had been genuinely real. We still have our little braids of hair in our bedside drawers that rather remind us of this extraordinary day. So that's my story. Are you happy, Lucy, now? Wow, I can't believe that. It's an incredible story, I said. I was completely astounded, because I knew that my brothers had indeed encountered a Bigfoot that day, and I was eager to see the braids the Bigfoot had left them on their ATVs. It's a sad story, I said, don't you think, about Nampina? I mean, goodness gracious, you only saw the Bigfoot because he was so heartbroken that day. He wasn't focusing on his surroundings properly. Did you check to see if he left any stones under the willow tree on the other side of the stream? I mean, didn't he say he would do that for you if he found a partner? And, of course, when he had children? We're always looking under the tree. We looked a couple of days ago, Hamish admitted. We do keep checking, you know. But to date we haven't found any stones under the tree. So I don't think he's found a partner yet. Which really sucks. Well, let's go and have another look. You never know. There might be a couple of stones there by now. Both Hamish and Cameron looked doubtful. But they humoured me and rolled up their pants to cross the ice-cold water of the stream. We walked over to the willow tree and it was Hamish who let out an audible gasp. For on the far side of the tree were two massive boulders, one bigger than the other, that had not been there a couple of days earlier. Oh my goodness gracious! There are two stones here! 
One is absolutely enormous. We couldn't even pick that up if we tried. He's left a message for you. He's telling you he's got a partner. We began waving our fists in the air excitedly. Yes, 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 we said excitedly. We knew the Bigfoot had found himself a partner, and our hearts were gladdened. I was sad when I returned to England, to leave the Dumbarton family behind me. They had been incredible hosts, and had warmly welcomed me into their homes and their lives, and my visit to America had been incredible. I was naturally disappointed not to have encountered the Bigfoot myself, but I still remain in contact with my brothers, and am close to my mother and her husband, Connor. A couple of years ago, my father got remarried to a lovely woman called Nancy. They are very happy together. My stepbrothers were glad to announce that one year they found a blue stone under the willow tree, left for them by the Bigfoot, and two years after that, they found a pink stone. So they do know that the Bigfoot has obviously sired a girl and a boy, and I'm thrilled for the creature. I'm still incredibly close to my best friend Paul. I'm glad that the old wounds of the past have finally been healed, and I've learnt the importance of forgiveness, because if you have hate in your heart, the only person you're actually hurting is yourself. The best thing I ever did in my life was to forgive my mother. I'm glad I did. Imagine your anger is like a piece of coal in your hand. If you keep holding it, you'll only be burning yourself. You need to let it go, for the wounds to actually heal. I'm due to go to America in the fall next year, to stay with my mother and her family. So if anything else happens, or if I do encounter a Bigfoot, you'll be sure to be hearing from me. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, that is a most wonderful story. Oh, it was just so lovely. What an incredible, incredible story. I hope I sounded all right. Unfortunately, I've got the flu. But I really enjoyed that story, and it was so well worth reading, and I hope you did too. Until next time, goodbye and good night.